from Syracuse is Steve Greenberg. He is a former communications director to two assembly speakers, now a pollster for Siena College. And in Albany, we are joined by Bob Bellafiore. He is a former press secretary to former Governor George Pataki and now a senior partner at Eric Mower & Associates. Thanks for joining me, guys. You bet. And thanks, Steve, Good from your uh, point, your undisclosed location. <laughs> YNN Syracuse. <laughs> So, okay, let's, let's talk about the budget, since it is, of course, the first thing on the agenda here, and, and everybody would like a budget deal any day now. Uh, the governor did this sort of interesting thing where he put his, almost his entire health care bill, his, his cuts, into the budget extender, and it seems to have worked because the legislators are now all busily talking about maybe getting a deal. Was this smart or not smart? We'll kick off with Steve. I, I think it was smart. I mean, first of all, it wasn't all that controversial. I mean, the, the, some of the members of the legislature made it sound controversial, but the cuts that the uh, governor sent up in his emergency bill were largely the cuts that the assembly included in their one house budget resolution two months ago. So there wasn't a lot of controversy in here. I think it was a smart tactic. I think the thing that surprised me the most about it, though, Liz, was the fact that he waited this long. I would have expected him to have tried this tactic earlier on, like right after he included the furloughs in an emergency spending bill. Uh, but I think you're right. I think it is moving the process along. By, by all accounts, uh, there is a substantive progress being made on actually getting a budget done two and a half months late. It, yeah, the thing about the furloughs, though, is he got smacked down by District Judge Lawrence Kahn, who said, hey, that's unconstitutional and violates a contract. But the, it, there are a number of people remarking now, like, hey, where did this tough-talking governor guy come from? Well, I think the furlough thing was a song and dance that would make Maury Chevalier proud. I think everybody knew that the governor would propose it and that it would be illegal um, and that the courts would shoot it down. And I think they, they knew it was a big fake. This time, I think it's a combination of really uh, uh, like a hardball tactic to try to get the legislature to do it. But I think they also sort of knew that these health care cuts had to come. You know, no one's exempt from the laws of supply and demand, and that includes the hospitals, that includes the schools, that includes the state workforce. And they knew that they were going to have to do this. So I think this, this dust-up that, that the governor took them to the brink and forced them to do something they didn't want to do is a lot of hooey. I think they knew they were going to do it, but I do think it has made them think, look, this is a tough thing in the budget, and we, maybe we should get the rest of this stuff done because we're going on three months. Yeah, and he's already actually said today that he is not going to put the, perhaps the most difficult thing that would be in the budget, education cuts, into the next round of budget extenders. He said he'll put actually some mental health cuts and, and perhaps some other things into the extender, but not challenging them with something that it really hurts, poking the stick in their eye, per se, maybe just poking them in the back a little bit. Right, right, right. In, in, in baseball, uh, you know, you would call this chin music, right? The governor throwing a high horn one underneath the legislature's chin. <laughs> I don't think that's what this is. I think I, I don't think this is real chin music at all, because the governor doesn't want to get into education, which is really about the most popular thing in the budget. Right. Steve, chin music or well, not well, chin music? Well, no, I, I actually think it is uh, chin music, but I mean, the real problem for the governor, I think he'd like to come out with the education cuts. The real problem for him is that he'd have to produce school aid runs, and what that means is he'd not just have to put in his emergency extender bill that he's cutting school aid by X billion, you know, one billion dollars. He'd actually have to list out school district by school district where those cuts were coming, and I think that is something that would be difficult for him to do and certainly something that would really push the legislature to the brink. We um, but the, the interesting thing about the governor, Liz, is that one week he's been talking tough, the next week he's been caving. One week he's yeah, been talking yeah. tough. You know, the question is, can he maintain this tough attitude for two, three weeks in a row and really push them to get a budget done? Well, I was actually just going to bring this up because just today we have a bit of breaking news. The governor just had a, a closed-door leaders meeting with the Democratic leaders, that is, John Sampson of the Senate and, and Sheldon Silver of the Assembly, not with the Republicans, who, of course, are in the minority, and said, hey, I'm open to borrowing as a, as a closing tactic. Uh, really? I'm sorry. Uh, he he op-edited against borrowing as if it being uh, this terrible thing. I mean, what, what, where is he? He's on the, all over the map on that. Uh, that's David Patterson 101. <laughs> I mean, and the, 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 that's always right, there, Steve. That's always been the issue with the governor is you never knew whether what he said one day was going to be in effect the next day. So, so, uh, so uh, at one point, as Liz says, he's uh, op-eds in the paper saying what a bad thing borrowing is, but he also knows that you... 
that you're not going to be able to, that the legislature and the executive don't have the fortitude to do this whole thing with cuts. They're going to have to go to the bank, have to you know whip out the taxpayers' ATM, and uh, you know and find a way to borrow on this thing. So he, I think he's just recognizing reality. Yeah, but it, it is the issue that has I think got that got David Patterson in trouble with the public. Remember, when he first took office, he had eight or nine really good months in terms of public opinion about him. And then it fell off the cliff. And I think part of what pushed him off the cliff, well, part of what he did to push himself off the cliff <laughs> was not being honest with people, saying one thing one day, another thing the next day, a third thing the third day. And I think that that's the problem that the governor has in terms of maintaining the pressure on the legislature to get things done. He seems to push them one day and be General Patton, and, and the next day, you know, he's just this uh, little corporal getting pushed around. Hey, Steve, I think maybe he could have been completely honest. He just was indecisive and didn't know what he thought. Yeah, and that's a fancy bit of contortionist. To push yourself off your own cliff is really something <laughs> unbelievable. And you also saw AG Andrew Cuomo, the, now the Democratic gubernatorial nominee, actually kind of weighing in on this um, from also an undisclosed location via a radio yeah. interview saying this was an intriguing tactic that the governor was doing. And, and of course, it was not the ultimate uh, or optimal way to have a budget negotiation, sort of the hidden uh, thing in there is I would do it much better, right? I mean, isn't that's how I read it? How did you think? Well, that, you know, I, I think that's that's clearly uh, the attorney general's uh, the, the, his inference. I mean, that's, I mean, really, that's what he's implying that he'd like people to have come away hearing what he says and go, well, boy, he'd have a much better uh, he'd have a much better way of doing this as opposed to uh, the current governor, who you know, whose whose public statements shift and contradict each other from day to day and week to week uh, and has a budget that's almost three months late. Now we're actually having this interesting political dust up uh, since we're now sort of edging our way into the campaign. We're seeing Rick Lazio, the gubernatorial nominee for the Republicans, taking a hit at Andrew Cuomo's lieutenant governor pick, Rochester Mayor Duffy, over his pension, accusing him of double dipping. That Was that a smart move or a not so smart move? You want to start? Uh, I, I think oh, Steve. He wants Go to for it, Steve. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I think it was an incredibly bad political move uh, and, and a bad substantive move as well. I mean, look, uh, Mayor Duffy served for more than 20 years as a Rochester police officer. He retired. He ran for office. The, the, the voters of Rochester elected him twice, knowing that he was a retired police officer on a pension, knowing that he was going to get a salary as uh, the Rochester mayor. It wasn't like he had to get a special exemption or... or you know, uh, twist arms to get this. This was perfectly legal, perfectly legitimate, perfectly well known by the voters who elected him twice. So the, the, for the uh, gubernatorial candidate of the Republican Party to take a shot at the LG uh, candidate of the Democratic Party is bad politics to begin with. And then it was substantively, I think, a, a really weak shot by, by Mr. Lazio. Bob? Well, look, I, you know, I think Steve makes a good point. I mean, I th and, and Steve, I think you'd agree if you were advising Lazio, you wouldn't have said pick on a cop for his pension. Um, it's not like he was a, a, a bureaucrat at the New York Power Authority uh, pulling in $250,000 and has a $150,000 public pension or authority pension and then gets appointed to some other high-paying job uh, and he's pulling both down. I mean, it's not like he's doing that. He was a cop. He no. was walking a beat. The guy walked around with a gun on his hip well, for 20 years. Well, he was years. a police chief. He didn't walk around with a gun on his I yeah. mean, you know, he well, wasn't a police chief. But, but, but he earned his way up. To, he earned his way he up. Earned his way yeah, up yeah, yeah, he sure, he did. Chief. Sure, he did. So, and, and, and let's not forget also that Rick Lazio served for a number of years in Congress. At some point, he's going to be eligible for a congressional pension. Who knows? Maybe it's while he'll be in elective office as well. And, it, it, I, and I think the, the challenge for Lazio is he's got to go. He's got to chip away at this image that Andrew Cuomo has built up that he is a reformer. I think that's the issue that the Attorney General is facing with the Working Families Party endorsement. And and Rick Lazio, if he's going to have any hope of winning, has to start chipping away at this. So he takes some hits for this. And the talking heads like Steve and me say, well, you know, we wouldn't have advised him to do that. But you know, over time, it may help create the impression that he wants to make that Andrew Cuomo's not the reformer he says he is. Yeah, I mean, the point yeah, but you know what, I don't. 
You get I'm the sorry, last word I, and hit it, Steve. <laughs> I, I don't think uh, Rick Lazio has the credibility yet to chip away with uh, chip away at Andrew Cuomo with the voters. What he's got to do is show the voters that he is the real solution. Then he can start to chip away at Andrew Cuomo. Well, your own polls show him down like 40. So he's got to he, you know he's got to chip. Away.